the next talk will be much more interesting because we're going to talk about money. Okay, so let us introduce our next speaker, Miss Michelle G. Tan. Finished her bachelor's degree in mathematics, major in actuarial science and statistics, and master's degree in mathematics at De La Salle University, where she has been teaching for 12 years. She is a PhD candidate in mathematics in the said university. So let us all welcome Ms. Michelle G. Tan. Okay, thank you, good afternoon. Welcome to the last talk for today. So this one is um, a little bit more interesting because we we see the application every day and we all want every one of us who want to learn how to grow our money, how to invest, or how to borrow. So not only um, about investment, uh, later on we'll be talking about uh, product tagging and tax, about uh, value added tax. So I'm going to start first with uh, investment. So usually I present uh, this problem to the class. Uh, I ask them, what do they do with the money that they save from their allowance? So usually they just uh, put it at home. Okay, so most of the students, uh, they don't have a savings account. But a few of them, um, they have a savings account. So the question for them uh, to answer at the end is that, uh, which is the best investment option for them? So currently, for example, if they have 100,000 and they want to invest this amount for one year, maximize the interest earned while also considering the uh, minimizing their risk of losing the money. So you went to the bank and you have been presented with the following investment options. So option A, savings account that will earn you 0.25% uh, annually. Option B, a time deposit account please for 120 days that will earn 0.3% annually. And the last one is a stock investment that is worth uh, 250 at present and knowing uh, at the end of the year it will be worth 252. Okay. So before they can answer this, so uh, some terms will be discussed. So um, we start with what is familiar with the student, a savings account. But basically, all they know is that you put the money in the bank and then after some time, you earn interest. But that's the basic knowledge that they know about the savings account. They don't know how to compute for the interest. Because uh, from time to time, the savings account, right, you uh, deposit money and then anytime you can withdraw your money and then again, you can do deposits and withdraw box. So that means the amount that you have in the bank is not Fixed, okay? So they don't have any idea on how to compute for that interest. Okay? So I'm going to discuss a few more terms. Okay? So first, uh, what are the essentials of savings account? So for us, uh, we are familiar with uh, this, um, some of this uh, essential little things about the savings account. So you can withdraw and deposit cash anytime. The bank pays the interest on the money that we leave in the account. And your money is insured up to 500000 <coughs> with the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation. So there are different types of savings, savings accounts. Like what we have here, this is from one bank, and then there are several options of savings account. So, um, I start off by differentiating between a simple interest and a compound interest. Okay. So the simple interest, is where the interest rate is fixed over a period of time. Okay. So the formula, um, I showed them the formula and how to compute for the future value of your money. Okay. But I also introduced them, there are already a lot of um, calculators in the website because uh, I, uh, I concentrated more on how to differentiate these different types of investment. Okay. So instead of doing the computation manually. Okay. So you can show them, uh, this is an example of a calculator. Okay. So this is, we have here this side. Okay. So using this, let's say we have a problem. 
you have 280,000 and you want to put it in a bank which gives you 0.75% interest. If you leave that for an entire year, how much interest will you earn at the end? So if you look at the app, you have there the things that you need to input. So you have your principal, which is 280,000, and then the rate is 0.75%. And then uh, what's nice about the app that uh, I use is the time. You can change. So if you're given is a number of days, you can change uh, the units into number of days. Or it can also be in terms of number of months so that you don't have to manually convert it to years. So just uh, you have there the calculate button and then afterwards you have the outcome. So this is, the trend, uh, this is already the future value. So at the end you have 280,100 pesos. So that means the interest earned here is 2,100 pesos. So if you leave your money in that bank for a year. Okay. So then uh, you can give more examples of this for them to calculate. Okay. Then afterwards, uh, I presented uh, another example, but this time, instead of leaving their money for one year, then this time it will only be for 90 days. So using this, the same app, so, um, using the same app, I just changed this part to number of days instead of years. So you don't have to manually put per day. So, and uh, for the number of days, okay, so it will depend. In uh, reality, in real applications, different banks could, uh, uses different denominator to convert the number of days. Some banks uses 365 and others use 360. So you may ask your students, okay, so which one will give you a higher interest? A bank which uses 365 for the conversion or 360 for the conversion? Okay, so let them do some computations and they will arrive at the answer. Okay, so for this one, if you just need it for 90 days, the total amount at the end of 90 days is 280,570.81. So I think uh, we can follow this part. Okay, so the second one is to dis uh, is to define what is the compound interest. Okay. So what I do here is I use the same principal value okay, for my problem. And then, uh, so in this one, 280,000 is still invested for a year. But instead of a simple interest, I change uh, the the interest to a compound interest which is compounded um, I think this should be oh for three years so this is an uh, example for three years with uh, correction sorry three years and the um, interest is compounded yearly okay so I just use another app and then if you would see the outcome uh, this app since uh, interest is compounded annually, so it will compute first for the value that you have after one year. And then after one year, you have a new principal and then uh, you will have the amount on the second year and then on the third year. So this is nice because you can explain to your students that um, unlike a, a simple interest, right? if you are investing that for three years, you're going to start at time zero, and then you're just going to do one computation at the end of the third year. But if you have a compound interest that is uh, compounded annually, so you're going to compute for the interest every year. So uh, then you can do a monthly or a uh, quarterly you know, uh, example. So I didn't do much of the example because I have a lot of things to you know, to introduce. So this is a comparison between a simple interest and a compound interest. Uh, one is, uh, they are both for one year, but one of them is compounded, I think this 
one should be compounded at all. Uh, yeah, it's not an add one at all. Uh, compound <laughs> because you notice know, the, uh, the interest for the second one is higher. I think this is very small for this one. So this one should be for three years. Um, my aim here, I got lost, but my aim here is to compare a uh, time for one year and one is a simple interest and another one should be compounded monthly. So that was what was on my mind because I want to let them see that at the end of the same one year you would be receiving a different uh, future value okay so that was what I was thinking but for some reason I okay now so since they already have a, an idea between the difference of a simple and compound interest now we can go on to compute for the interest that they earn uh, if they have a savings account okay so, for example, this is what you usually, uh, you can have the balance of your savings account. So, assuming an interest rate of 1.5% per annum, okay? And then, there is a monthly compounding period and the following uh, account information for uh, one month, we have this. So, we want to find the amount of interest that will be credited to the client account at the end of the month. So this is for the month of January. So first, we have to learn how to compute for the average daily balance. Okay. So how do we look for this average daily balance? Okay. So what we do is, uh, from January 1 to January 9, the balance in the account is 1,320,000. So for 9 days, you're going to multiply the balance with the number of days to get the accumulated balance okay so for the next one you have here from january 10 to january 17 the but balance that you have in your account is 1,370,000. so that's for eight days you multiply that by eight okay so in that manner you're going to get a total accumulated balance so we're going to use this total accumulated balance to compute for our average so this one here is the accumulated balance for 31 days. So I think we have an idea on how to get the average daily balance. So we're going to divide the total, uh, the accumulated balance by the total number of days. So that means that's your average daily balance. Because they cannot, uh, you'll not be able to compute for the interest if you would have a different amount for how many days. So that's why you have to get the average daily balance. Okay. So using the average daily balance, since it is stated there that the uh, interest is 0.5%, uh, 1.5%, .5, right? So let's compute for the interest. So our principal is this amount times the interest times the time. So this would be the interest earned for that savings account. And aside from that, uh, you have to also uh, add in that there is a uh, tax that is deducted in your savings account. So uh, I'm going to discuss that more. So what's the, uh, what's the difference between a savings account and a time deposit? So that's the next um, uh, type of investment that I, uh, I introduced. Okay. So the time deposit is similar to a savings account, but the difference is that you have to put your money in the bank for a fixed period of time. So that's the only difference. So there are different types of terms. Sometimes you have your 30 days, uh, they have 60 days, 90 days, or 120 days. So that means Let's say you pick uh, 30 days. So that means for the duration of 30 days, you cannot with, withdraw your money. Okay, so, um, but everything is the same except for that time that we have to wait. Okay. So what are the problem or what will be the, uh, what will you face if you terminate your time deposit before the maturity date? So if you terminate your deposit before the maturity date, there is a penalty from the bank, okay? 
So usually the penalty is the bank will ask you to pay for the documentary stuff, which is usually uh, the bank shoulders this documentary stuff. Okay. And then uh, aside from the interest that you earn, again there is a withholding tax of 20% to be deducted in your account. So see, similar to a savings account, so there is still a 500,000 uh, insurance covered by the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation. Okay, so what happens if your time deposit reach your maturity date? So you have the following choices. First, you can withdraw everything. So let's say after 30 days, you get your principal and your internet. Second one is that you just take your earning and reinvest the principal. So if you invested ten thousand, you get the interest and you invest again your ten thousand. And the, uh, they call this the rollover. Okay, so the rollover is that after let's say the fixed time of thirty days, you invest everything. So the ten thousand plus the interest you invest that you call that uh, they use the term there rollover. Okay. So sometimes uh, you can instruct, you can explain to your students that uh, you can instruct the bank that uh, you can sign a form wherein you can continue to roll over your account unless you give an instruction. Okay, okay so we're done with uh, two types. This is a sample computation. If you notice here uh, on the interest earned, I have there a multiplier of 0.8 because uh, I'm showing to the class that 20% is deducted for withholding tax. So that means the money that you are going to get is just the 80% okay. okay, so you can give them uh, this type of activity wherein uh, this one here has a different interest rate and a different denominator. So you can ask them to compute for the interest after taxes, so that means after deducting the 20%, okay? And then afterward, they should get this values, and then they'll be able to compare uh, which box gives uh, the highest uh, no, uh, interest uh, after tax. Now, uh, on the... Web, there is also this. <coughs> and, uh, there is this site wherein they have a list of different tasks, and then you can just input there how much you want to put in your bank deposit. So, for example, here, uh, the money that you want to invest is fifty thousand for let's say twelve months. So, and then uh, it will give you a list of the different interest rates. Uh, that you can earn from the different tax. Okay, so I can just find this in the. Uh, in the okay, so the third one is what we call the money market account. So what's the difference now? So in time deposit, you have a fixed amount of time. In a money market account, usually you need a higher minimum balance. So usually in a savings account, the minimum balance that you need is thousand pesos or five thousand pesos in a time deposit usually it's the same case you have five thousand or ten thousand you can have a time deposit account but in a money market uh, there is a higher minimum balance usually 50 or 100 thousand so what's the difference between the money market and the savings account so here withdrawals may be limited okay so you can still withdraw but sometimes they would limit you to this amount and what is very interesting here is that the interest rate. So the interest rate is not fixed. So there is a risk involved here. So unlike the savings account, if the uh, bank will tell you that it's, one, um, let's say, 1%, so it will be a fixed 1%. But in the money market, it will depend on the market because they invest your money. So there are times, there are months where if the interest rate will be higher, than other money. Okay? So, yun yung difference between a savings account and a money market account. Okay? Uh, same, uh, same condition, everything, all the money that we earn will be taxable. So, this 
one is uh, if you talk about stocks and bonds, this would be something new to the students. They have heard about stocks, but they don't really have an idea about what uh, what is a stock and a bond. Okay, so a stock represents shares of ownership in a company. A share represents a unit ownership of a corporation's profit and assets. Ownership can be quantified by dividing the number of shares by the number of shares. So, uh, I have an example here. If everyone would be investing one million, then they will each own one fourth of the company or of the business. But in the second scenario here, they don't have the same amount invested. So you have your 20 million, 10 million, 10 million, and 30 million. So A will own two seven, B will own, uh, B and C will own one seven of the company, and E will own three seven. So that's the concept of stocks. So if you buy a share, you would be part owner of the company. Okay. So. What are the two different, uh, what are the things that we need to know about stocks? So a stockholder receives a certificate wherein it will be indicated there the name of the corporation, the owner's name, and the number of shares that you have of the company. Okay? So sometimes they include what we call a par value. So what is the par value? A par value for a share <coughs> refers to the stock value stated in the corporate charter. So it has nothing to do with the value, market value. So it's different with the market value. Uh, a dividend is, on a share is a payment made by the corporation to the shareholder when the corporation's profit or services. So there is an additional um, amount of money that you can get. So dividend is based on par value and not on the market value. So the one that you see in the news, that's the market value of your stocks. Okay, so there are two types of stocks. You have your common stocks and the preferred stocks. So what's the difference between the two? A common stock represents shares of the company's asset and profit. The board of directors oversee the management of the company but do not directly run the company. Common stocks are higher in risk and has a high return. So although common stocks yield higher return than other stocks, common shareholders tend to lose moves when a company goes bankrupt. Okay. While the other one, the preferred ones, are guaranteed a fixed dividend before any dividends are distributed to the stockholder. So that means if you are, uh, there's the difference between a common and preferred, the preferred will get the dividend first before the common. So, but uh, you will be earning, uh, there would be a higher risk here, but you would have a higher possible earning if you have a common stock. Because the common stock base, uh, you can base your profit on the market value. Okay? So, what I ask my students to do is to go to the website and check for the different listings of the companies. So, I ask them to look for uh, some of the companies and check for the market values of those companies. Okay. So, I did one activity. I said, assuming that you have 10,000 pesos. And I gave them two weeks for the activity. So, I asked them to invest there. 10,000 pesos. So they choose their own company to invest that. And then I ask them to keep a record every day on what is the value of the um, stock that they uh, bought. Okay? And then after two weeks, so everyone, they're going to sell the stocks that they bought. So and then um, they added everything. So some of them invested in one company alone. So it was nice because and then some of them, they chose the company that are well known. For example, like what we have here, you have Universal Robina or you have your SM, Johnny Vito. They invested in well known companies. But I was surprised that there were students, they chose the company that has a low value in their stocks. Those companies that are not really well known. And um, more or less, on the average, um, most of them earn a few uh, 
a few uh, no, profit uh, and uh, some of them lost. But uh, I saw in them, in their reaction, that they can do it. So it's not something that is difficult. And they felt that uh, they can earn in something that they ha they decide on where to put their money, when they can get their money, and so on. So uh, I found, uh, from my point of view, I thought that it was really interesting for them. And then they were happy. Yung mga, those who profited, they were really happy. Shante, those who are not. But basically, they were asking me, um, Ma'am, if we lose our money, are you going to fail us? Of course not. Because this is an exercise for them to just um, try to, uh, to give them an idea how to work with stuff. So basically what I do is uh, everyone who did the work, they have the same score. And then those who profited, so they have a bonus. So you give them a bonus points for the profit that they made. Okay? So it was nice. So if you have a longer time, then instead of two weeks, you can extend the time. And then uh, what I did is, I, uh, they cannot sell their stocks within the two weeks. So if you have a longer period of time, maybe you can allow them to sell their stocks and buy another one. And then so you can do those type of, you know, um, arrangement. Okay, so there are two ways to earn money from stocks. So we're earning our trade uh, out to you in form of dividends, and uh, some you would have to rely on the market value. Okay, so uh, we're not going to do um, so, uh, computation. So you just have to know also about the, um, for example. Uh, you own a share of company which will pay you 20 per share in an annual dividend. So in this type, you have the dividend. If the original price per share is 1,000 and the current price is 120, the total return of investment will be computed by this formula. So appreciation in price plus dividend divided by the initial stock price. So the appreciation would be 1,020 minus 1,000, which is 20, plus the 20 of the uh, annual dividend, and divide that by the initial stock, which is 1,000. So the total return of investment for that company is 4%. So obviously, you want a higher return of investment. Okay, so you can discuss this to them. Uh, important tips on how to... Uh, you can invest in company that you understand. So stay for a while. Don't panic when uh, you lost in the first few weeks. Don't fear fluctuation. Okay? So you can give them some of this information. Okay, so what's the difference between the stocks and the bond? Okay. So a bond is a loan. Okay? So a corporation issues bonds to whoever wants to buy them. When you buy, you lend money to the corporation that issues it. The corporation in return promises to pay interest for you for the length of the loan. So, kumbaga, if you are the person buying the bond, okay. So that's why uh, you have a fixed return. So your written in the certificate is the fixed return. So there are two types of bonds. You have the government bond. So this is the uh, one issued by government and the one issued by a uh, private company. So you have the corporate box, okay? So, um, if I, I'm going to compare between the difference of stock and, stocks and bonds, okay? So in your stocks, you have your borrowing interest, while in your bond, you have your fixed interest. Uh, the problem is that you have a higher return in your stocks because it's not not fixed, so there's a chance of a higher return. But the problem is also you have a higher risk. Okay? And then, just in case at the end, if the company goes bankrupt or anything, the one holding the bonds will have a claim first on the money before the one holding the uh, stocks. Okay. Next. Okay. So this one is called the mutual fund. So a mutual fund is an investment company that pulls together money from different investors and they invest that. 
So usually the tank, they play the role of that company. Okay. So when you go to the tank, they have, uh, they pull the money of different people and then they invest it. So for example, you explained it to your class. Uh, you're new to stocks and bonds. You don't have any idea. So what you do is just, you choose a bank, check for the uh, investment uh, mutual funds of the bank, and then you invest in the bank. The bank will be the one to invest your money in certain stocks or equity. Okay. So a mutual fund company issues share to the public that represent their holding in the fund. So the same thing you have their share. Then what we have to check is the net asset value per share. So this is always given. You always know this. You can check this every day. Uh, this is the price of every share of the mutual fund. Okay? So uh, it will depend on the market performance. Uh, these are the different types of mutual funds. So you have the money market fund. They invest purely in short term, one year or less. Equity fund invests primarily in shares of stocks. Bond fund invests in long term uh, government or corporation debt instruments. And then the balance fund invests in both shares of stocks and uh, instruments. So you can uh, make an activity wherein they can go to the bank because there are a lot of banks near schools, right? So you can ask them to go there and then ask about the different types of mutual funds. Because this one, each one has a different risk, okay? So one will have a higher risk than the other one. One will have a higher profit than the other one. So they can do this, give them a chance to explore. <coughs> so what are the good things if you invest in mutual funds? So you don't have to select a specific stocks or bond. The balance fund will automatically choose. It's a good choice when the investor is not an expert on investing. So, and then, not so good thing, the fee will be a little higher. So of course, if someone is investing for you, then you have to pay a little bit. Okay. So this is an example of the um, value. So there are different um, <coughs> products here and you have their <coughs> value so you just have this is the value per share okay so you can also do this similar to what i have done this uh stocks you can ask them to buy for uh you put money in i uh, know mutual funds and then ask them to check for the value after some time okay so it will just depend on the number of shares so, so this is an example uh, suppose that you want to invest 500000 with the Sunrise Financial Equity Fund. And then at the time, the value per share is 3000 uh, It's 31201 So if you have that money, that, that means you can buy uh, 160000 I think this should be 3100 There's a point there that this means. Okay, yeah, that's the point. Okay, so it would be, this would be 3.1201 to have a number of shares that is 160,251. Okay, so at least I know that you're trying to complete what I have here. Okay, so after uh, that time, the value of the fund became, this should be, I I get a point, 3.5024. So, this number of share, you multiply that to the value per share, that would be the amount that you have after uh, that period. So that means you earn 61,260. Okay, so another activity at the end, you can ask your students, let's see, they have 100,000 each, and then you can ask them to, to do whatever investments that they want to do. Okay. And of course, there should be a documentation and how to do this. Okay, um, loan is a type of borrowing, and there are different types of loan. You can have a one-time payment, several payments, or uh, several regular payments. Okay, so usually I don't uh, discuss much of invest uh, of borrowing because they are more investment rather than borrowing. Okay, so, but maybe they would be interested about the regular payment. So the regular payment is called an annuity. 
So our admin is that you borrow a certain amount, let's say you borrow 100,000 and you want to pay that in a year time, monthly payment of a regular amount. So that would be a little interesting. Or maybe, uh, give an example, uh, you're going to buy a car, you have a down payment, and then, or let's change it. Na, wag na lang car, kasi masyadong mahal for that. Let's say they want to buy a cell phone, something that they can relate. They want to buy a cell phone, they have a down payment, and then they have to make regular pay. So they can give them those types of examples. Okay? Uh, credit cards, we just given them an idea. So this is a plastic card that contains information and authority that a person whose name appears on it to charge a purchase or service. So I just discussed uh, some of the terms, but not much of about credit cards. Okay? Okay. Then the second part of the consumer mathematics is about taxes. So first one is about the value added tax. So a value added tax is a form of sales tax. The tax consumption um, on the sales, barter, exchange, or lease of the goods or properties and services in the Philippines and on the import, importation goods into the Philippines. So for example, we have here a payment of 550 pesos. So it's, uh, that is already included in 550 pesos. So you can ask your students to compute for that 12% that is uh, included there. So you have here the computation. So you can ask them to do that first. Okay. And uh, for the income tax, they are not really very interested because they still don't have their salary, so they are uh, not paying income tax. So, but uh, what what uh, I explained to them, it's not, it doesn't mean that since they don't have a salary, they are not paying any tax. So, for example, if you have a savings account or a time deposit, remember there is a 20% withholding tax. So, I was telling them, I was, ex I was explaining to my student that even as a student, don't earn your salary, you're still paying your tax to the government, okay? And then, so I think it would be interesting for people who earn money, so how to break down the uh, tax. So this is, I have here an example. So for example, if someone earns 752,000, okay, the total income, and there is an exemption of 100,000. So that means the amount that can be taxable would be 652,000. So if you look at the tax bracket, if you earn more than 500,000, you're going to pay already a base of 125,000 for your income and 32% in excess over 500,000. So if we go back to our example, this is already in excess of more than 500. So that means you pay uh, 125,000 and the excess amount you multiply by 32%. So you have the four, you have your 48,640, so the total will be the uh, income tax. Uh, okay, this one would be a little interesting to them because they use uh, they use products and books. Okay, so product tabs are used for easy identification. So if you go to the grocery and look at the product, you have there the like the barcode that what we know. Okay, so what's the importance of the product tab? Okay, so each time product tabs are typed or scanned computers or transmitted in some other fashion, there is a chance that one or more digits in the number will change. So the aim of that product tagging is for them to be able to check the product that is in the store or is the product already sold out. Okay? The price, the details. Okay. Now uh, there was to avoid those errors, okay? So they are trying to avoid avoid what you call the transmission error. So what are these types of trans transmission error? So you have the single digit transmission error. So this is an example. So if you look at the difference between the two, you four again nine. So that's a single digit error. So most of the error is 
uh, due to this little digit error. So yung uh, frequency of error na yan is 79.1%. And then we have the different types of error. So our idea is we want to avoid this error. So how do we avoid this error? So to avoid this error, we apply the method called check digit scheme. So, an example of this error correcting codes, which are able to identify errors and then correct them automatically. Actually, the math that uh, we use behind this check or error is uh, number 3B, your module law. Okay, so that's the math that we use behind this. So, uh, let's, uh, let's have a review of the modular arithmetic. Given integers A and B and positive number N, we say that A and B are congruent if um, N divides A minus B. So, for example, so we have here is 39 congruent to 6 modulo 11. So, 39 minus 6 is 36. So, modulo divided by 11. 33 divided by 11 is 3. So, that means yes. Okay. How about the second one? Is 23 congruent to 0 modulo 10? No, because 23 is not divisible by 11. So you ask them to do this kind of combination before you do the result of the universal product code. So this is an example of the universal product code. So every item that you purchase from a grocery store and the bar store has the universal product code. So the bar code was originally created to help grocery stores speed up their checkout process and keep better track of the inventors. So what is the requirement for the check in So this is the use of the universal product code. You have to look at the uh, numbers. So when uh, the 12 digit number, the first digit identifies the type of product. So if you have zero, that means it's general grocery. If you have the number two, it's meat and protein. Number three, drugs and drug products. Number four, non-food items. Number five, coupons and so on. So there are uh, meaning for those numbers. Nilang siya basta-basta number. Okay? And what's more interesting is that the second set of five digits identifies the manufacturer. So meron naka-assign for every manufacturer. And the third five sets of digits identifies the product. The last digit is called the check digit. So yung last digit na yan, that will um, lessen the error. You ma correct yung error. What we call this your check digit. So all in all, you have your 12 digits. So your 12 digit uh, code must satisfy the given equation. So ano yon? <laughs> 3 times the first digit plus the second digit plus 3 times the third digit and so on should be congruent to 0 modulo 10. So in other words, a more simple explanation is that the total should be a multiple of 10. Okay, so that's why uh, you can easily explain that if it should be a multiple of 10. So, uh, for example, this is a universal product code. So you can ask them to Verify, this uh, is a valid universal product code. So if we multiply using the formula that we have, you can see that the total would be 40. And 40 is uh, congruent to 0 modulo 10. So that means this is a valid universal product code. You can make things a little interesting by... Um, you can um, give them an example wherein one digit is not given. So instead of giving them the whole 12 digits, give them 11 digits and ask them to supply for that one digit so that the universal product code will be valid. Okay. So similarly, and show that on that. Similarly, you have the same concept for the ISBN number. Okay, so for the international standard book number, uh, the first nine digits represent information regarding the language, the publisher, and the title. And the last digit, again, is the check digit. So uh, it's congruent to zero mode 11. So that means the total should be divisible by 11. Okay, so but we have a different formula. 
uh, it would be 1 times the first digit, 2 times the second digit, 3 times the third, and so on. So, uh, a little variation in the formula. So, then, aside from that, uh, the first digit, 0 tells the book is positioned either US or UK. You can give an example, Australia, uh, Australia New Zealand, or Canada. The 8218 here, for example, will identify the positive shape. So this code is being applied for, and this is the code for the American Mathematical Society. And then this one is given to each book. So each book is assigned a four-digit number. And the last digit here is the check digit. So for example, you can, just, uh, you can give the student this one and ask them to supply for the last digit so that this would be a valid ISBN number. Okay, so ito yun. So find the value of C so that this will be a valid ISBN number. So I think you can do this uh, follow to this is, uh, PowerPoint. Okay, and the last one is called the quick respond code. You see this? So I ask them where they see this code. So usually they will tell me some more, the right? They have this big pictures of that. So you call that a uh, quick respond code. So this was, uh, uh, this started in Japan by Denso Wave in 1994. So it is designed to allow high-speed component scanning. It is detected as a two-dimensional digital image by a semiconductor image sensor. Okay, so what are important here? The smaller square on the corner of the image is for size, orientation, and angle viewing. So you have there the squares. Okay, so you need a smartphone so you saw the app so that you can uh, scan for the code. Then the code will convert this to a URL and shows you what is behind the code. Okay? So the higher the error correction level, the less storage value you need. So the time the, uh, the disabled shows the error correction capability in each level. So I think what will be interesting to the students is they can create their own uh, no, they can create their own quick response code. They can use this website to create their own quick response code. Or, uh, yeah. so the activity for this part is you can ask them to bring some product from the grocery and uh, a book with an ISBN number and then they can verify that the product code and the ISBN number is valid and then they can create their own quick response code. You can also use uh, Google to create a quick response code. Okay? So, I think uh, that's the last. Uh, so, these are some questions for blogging. Okay? And then, are there any questions from the group? <laughs> Yeah, um, th there are not much computation, but the, you would find out that students are would be very interested in this topic because they feel that this is the topic that they, that can be useful a lot to them. Okay, so kung wala nang questions, gagala pa kayo, you're going somewhere else. I'll let you go. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Michelle Khan. So, in behalf of the organizing committee of the 19th BPP Mathematics and Statistics Lecture Series, we would like to award this certificate of appreciation.